welcome. You're listening to Latin Waves with your host, Sylvia and Stuart Richardson. Latin Waves is more than just hot rhythms. This is a show about community, about creating a culture that is inclusive and based on fairness. Because everyone deserves dignity, respect, and has something to contribute. A new world is possible, and it all starts with us. I'm delighted to be joined by Jorge Marti. He's at Secretariat of Hensa, Venezuela. Thank you for joining us, Jorge. It's a pleasure, as always. Now, the world has been on pins and needles uh, witnessing the uh, recent attack on Ukraine. And for many, it has been, you know, an easy street to demonize, right, Russia for its actions. And I feel that what brings us to this point is important. And since 1989, you know, the U.S. has been the empire and it has broken several agreements that has now put Russia on alert. How do you read the situation and where should we focus in this conflict? Well, I mean, I'm the secretary of the Hans of Venezuela campaign. What am I doing talking about Ukraine and Russia? But in fact, uh, a few years ago, I also participated in the setting up of the Solidarity with Anti-Fascist Resistance in Ukraine campaign. So I, uh, I did quite a lot of research about the region, and I talked to a lot of comrades in Ukraine, in Russia, and so on. And I tried to, uh, I tried to inform uh, myself about the real situation. And I think that this is the first thing that we need to say. Uh, here in the West, I'm, I'm in London, you're in Canada. Uh, we, we are subjected to a barrage of uh, propaganda on the part of our own uh, imperialists. And on the basis of this, you cannot understand what is happening in, in Ukraine or in Russia. And the first task that you have is, is to cut through the fog of lies and propaganda and try to understand the real reasons for this uh, conflict. I would also like to say straight from the beginning that I am against the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I think that uh, that uh, Russia's uh, motives are, are not uh, democratic, they're not clear. They, they are imperialist motives. But, but the reasons I am against Russia's invasion have nothing to do with the hypocritical reasons that the West is opposing this uh, intervention. The West, uh, Western powers have no uh, moral standing to criticize anyone about anything. Now they go on about territorial integrity being violated, national sovereignty, and so on. But they are the ones who have been doing exactly the same thing for so long, for hundreds of years. But even in the last 20 years, I mean... NATO bombed Serbia for 78 days, killing uh, dozens, hundreds of innocent civilians in 1999. Today I was, I was hearing Jen Stoltenberg, I think his name is, the General Secretary of NATO. He was saying, oh, Russia's using cluster bombs. In, this is illegal. It's a war crime. But NATO used cluster bombs in, uh, in uh, the bombing of Serbia in 99. And nothing was said at that time. Apparently, at that time, it wasn't a war crime. Or, for instance, the other day I heard Condoleezza Rice, who was the Secretary of State in 2003 when the United States invaded Iraq. And she was being interviewed on uh, Fox News, and they said to her, so this is a scandal because when a country invades another sovereign country, that's a war crime. And Condoleezza Rice kept a straight face and said, yes, yes, she, 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 nodded, she nodded along. I mean... Condoleezza Rice was responsible for the invasion of Iraq, a sovereign country. Wasn't that a war crime at the time? So, uh, and, and even today, you don't have to go back in time. Even today, there's, there's, a, there's a criminal war going on uh, of Saudi Arabia against Yemen. And, and this war is being conducted in the most uh, atrocious uh, manner. The first thing they did was to bomb the harbors so they wouldn't have any food coming in. They've been bombing uh, markets, schools weddings, hospitals, and Saudi Arabia, nothing said about that. There are no journalists in Yemen giving you the day-to-day -day rundown of what is happening. Because why? Because uh, Saudi Arabia is, is, is our friend, is, is, a, is a close ally of U.S. and Western imperialism, so therefore we don't say anything about this. So uh, I think our first task is precisely to denounce the, the hypocrisy of Western imperialism. Then about this question that you, that you asked, 
because I think that this is important to put it in, in context. Yes, R- Russia has now invaded uh, Ukraine, but this conflict had, didn't start on the 20, 24th of February. This con- conflict started many years ago, uh, after the fall of um, Stalinism, after the fall of the Soviet Union in 89-91. The, the, the Western imperialism started a push towards the East, and they started advancing and advancing, and more and more countries were joining NATO. And as you say, there was a written, verbal, unwritten guarantees that were given by uh, the West. James Baker, who at the time was, was the negotiator for the United States, told uh, Gorbachev, uh, and then they put it in writing. There's a document, actually. There's a transcript of that conversation, which is up, up in, the, in some official website in the United States. You can read it. And it says, in a change for the reunification of Germany, we promise that uh, NATO will not advance an inch towards the east. And what's happened since? Well, about I think it's about 17 countries have joined uh, joined NATO. A whole number of countries in Eastern Europe have joined uh, NATO, and this is rightly so seen as a threat by by Russia. By Russia, by whom in Russia? By, by Russian capitalists, by, by the Russian government, which is a capitalist uh, government and has its own interests, which are in conflict with the interests of the United States. Yeah. Uh, Russia will like to have its own sphere of influence in, in Eastern Europe, across its border, uh, in, in the Caucasus, in uh, Central Asia, perhaps also a little bit in, in the Middle East, in Syria, where they have a, a naval base. And of course, they they, they can't uh, accept this, this constant encirclement by by NATO. And one thing leads to another. And on both sides, these are imperialist uh, interests. When Putin says he's intervening in in the Ukraine in order to defend the interests of the Russian-speaking people in the in the Donbas, that that's uh, that's just an excuse. In the same way, by the way, that NATO said they were bombing Serbia in order to defend. The interest of the Kosovo are uh, Albanians. There is nothing to do. Imperialists always look for a, for a so-called humanitarian uh, reason for the intervention. Mm. And, then, and then when the imperialists talk about uh, sovereignty of uh, Ukraine, what kind of sovereignty are you talking about when, when in Ukraine you have a government whose policies, economic policies are dictated by the IMF, and uh, its government is uh, subject to the to the whims of the U.S. embassy. Uh, this is no independent sovereign government, but 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 a puppet of U.S. imperialism in the in the region. So there, there's a lot of hypocrisy. And our first task, as as people who live in in the West, uh, in Canada, in, in Britain, or in the United States, is to denounce our own ruling class and the, the imperialist uh, designs. Everyone now says about. Uh, civilian victims of this conflict in Ukraine, and there are all imperialist wars. There's no surgical strikes, as they say, mm. uh, as the U.S. said in, in relation to to Afghanistan and and, uh, and Iraq. Uh, any war kills innocent civilians. Mm. They are the ones who pay the price for big powers fighting uh, over markets and resources. But no one says anything about the fact that in Ukraine there has been a civil war going on for eight years in which the government in Kiev responded to uh, an uprising and protest in the east of the country by waging a unilateral war against their own, uh, against their own people. Uh, and I think it's about 14,000 people have been killed in the Donbass in these last eight, eight years. There was no outcry about that uh, or the fact this war is being conducted partially by neo-Nazi battalions, which are incorporated in the in the Ukrainian National Guard, and they are funded and armed, given weapons and training, not only by the Ukrainian government but also by the governments of, of the UK, the government of Canada, and the governments, mm-hmm. the government of the United States. Uh, and these are the people who are at the front uh, at the front line of this war. Now we see about the siege of uh, Mariupol in our, in our TV screens. Well, Mariupol is, is the place where, where the Azov Battalion is based, a uh, neo-Nazi formation of thousands of uh, armed uh, men who are part of the Ministry of Interior in, in Ukraine. And so, so that explains why, why there's so much uh, resistance. And in the process, of course, many innocent pe- pe- people and, and civilian infrastructure is, is bombed and, and destroyed. It's uh, terrible. Lenin once said, by the way, Lenin said, 
War is terrible. Yes, war is terribly profitable. We have seen in the last few days that the stocks mm. and the shares of uh, weapons companies in the UK and in Europe, in the United States, going up through the roof. They're gonna they're gonna make a lot of money out of the suffering of ordinary uh, civilians and working people, uh, and so on. And then the response of the West is what? Uh, impose sanctions on Russia. Who's going to pay for these sanctions? We know what sanctions mean. Yeah. Sanctions mean that ordinary working people in Russia will pay for these sanctions. When we think about empire, you know, in many ways, the empire of the day is the U.S. And when we think about NATO expanding into the East, people think, oh, they're bringing democracy. That's how the media plays it here. But NATO is a military arm of empire and it's at the service of the U.S. So can you talk a little bit about the significance of both the NATO incursion, right? And then the economic arm of violence, which is the IMF, the rules and dictates how people should, you know, allocate their economic wealth you know, at the service of empire. And NATO claims NATO claims no we're not we're not a threat to anyone. We are a, we are a defensive uh, alliance and uh, yes as you say we do bringing democracy. They're not bringing democracy. They're bringing capitalism and subjection to U.S. imperialism. That's what they're bringing. I mean, it's hard to describe Turkey as a democratic country, as a country that is, uh, is destroying its own uh, Kurdish people in the, in, the, in the East and its own working class across the whole country. Uh, it's hard to describe, I don't know, uh, Hungary as a fully democratic uh, country. And, uh, you know, in the meantime, they, they say, oh, in Russia, a uh, number of media newspapers and radio stations have been closed down. And yes, they have. And, and, and that's a consequence, reactionary consequence of, of war. But over here, we, they just banned uh, Russia Today and Sputnik from broadcasting in, in the whole of the European Union. And so now they say, oh, the, these, are, these are arms of the Russian state that uh, they only give you propaganda. Yes, yeah, so now we, we don't have access to that propaganda. We are only subject to our own propaganda. Uh, that, that's completely scandalous. And yes, as you say, it's, it's not uh, just NATO, it's, it's the IMF. And I will add, and the European Union, they dictate the economic policies. And uh, in fact, if the European Union is interested in Ukraine at all, it's as, as a reserve of cheap labor, cheap skilled uh, labor. Millions of people from Ukraine have had to emigrate because of the collapse of the economy. And the collapse of the economy has come because of the restoration of capitalism. And, and the way this has been carried out, this has been a massive looting of state property by a number of uh, oligarchs. Avakov, Ah Ahmenov, Kolomoisky, Poroshenko himself. All of these people benefited. They became millionaires. How? By looting state property. And then by uh, turf wars, by killing each other and, and so on. And now this, this government of Zelensky was about to carry out a, a further program of massive privatization of state-owned uh, enterprises, of which there are still some, which are, which are a remnant of the, of the old industrial power of Soviet um, Ukraine. This is also violence. Millions of people forced to emigrate, thousands killed in the, in the civil war. Parties being driven underground. The Communist Party has been illegalized in uh, in Ukraine uh, a few years ago, and uh, all the left organizations have been forced underground or into exile. This is also violence, and this is and this is the way uh, U.S. imperialism advances. And you are com completely correct. Uh, in my opinion, Russia acts as an imperialist power, but but Russia's imperialism is not comparable at all to that of the United States. The United States imperialism is much stronger and therefore much more aggressive and, uh, and reactionary by many degrees of, of magnitude. It has a much more powerful economy, a much more powerful army, military bases uh, everywhere, and, and a much higher percentage of military spending. And it's uh, ruthless in the pursuit of the uh, interests of U.S. Uh, multinationals. And we have seen this. Yeah. Not only in Europe, in Eastern Europe, but everywhere in the Middle East, in uh, in Latin America, uh, in Africa, everywhere. In many ways, you know, it's um, it's a very dangerous 
game despite the fact that the US is still a more powerful empire um, Russia does have you know thousands of nuclear weapons at its disposal and it is playing with fire you know bringing NATO into war with Russia um, can we talk a little bit about the consequences because I mean when the US bombed Libya in a so-called preemptive war no one blinked an eye, right? When uh, Israel bombs, you know, uh, Palestinians, there's no news reporting, right? And, and the world just accepts some words as sanction and other words are denounced, right? And for those of us who have been through war, no war is, a, you know, is justified, right? Like the loss of human life should always be denounced. And also, I think the time of empires you know it's it, it's about time we we the workers see beyond that right and, and unite across borders because really our you know our so-called elected officials are not going to do it for us we, we should also uh, understand for, for instance the other day they had this uh, resolution at the united nations general assembly against russia's invasion of ukraine and it was passed with, I don't know, 178 votes in favor, 30 or 40 abstentions, I can't remember. Uh, but ne but then uh, the United Nations uh, has no plays no real role, you know, it's just a talking shop. And uh, But uh, the United Nations has passed un almost unanimous resolutions, for instance, against the blockade of Cuba for 20 years. Last time it was, I think, 194 votes uh, against the blockade. Two in favor, Israel and the United States, and two abstentions, Brazil and Ukraine. Uh, before that, they passed a, uh, another resolution uh, against the oppression of the Palestinians, and that's also passed unanimously with the votes against of Israel and the United States. And it serves absolutely for nothing. So when they talk about international law, what, what they really mean is the law of the of the one who has the mightiest uh, military, the mightiest army, the mightiest uh, military power. Uh, but yes, we, we are against uh, imperialist uh, wars, but in order to achieve peace, we need, you need to understand where these wars come from. These wars, they don't come because Putin is mad, as they say, or, or because Biden is crazy. It's not that. It's, it's economic power, uh, economic interests, the interest of the multinationals, that they need uh, sources of raw materials, sources of energy, markets for the products, markets for export of capital. This is what imperialism uh, is in the last 100 years. And so in order to put an end to imperialism, which is the cause of wars of uh, aggression, you need to put an end to the system that's behind it, the capitalist system. And this you can only do by the workers uh, coming to power and removing this uh, unelected, unaccountable minority of millionaires who run uh, countries and and the world in in the interest of their own private profit? This is the this is the only way uh, forward. Yeah. You can uh, you can feel sorry for for the human loss. Uh, anyone who's human will ha will have empathy for the victims of war. But if you're really serious about putting an end to war, then you need to take the the road of revolution, revolutionary change. One of the things that I am very aware of is that we are told constantly, oh, the capitalist system is just, um, you know, in a cycle, right? It will recover. And, you know, the collapse of the capitalist system in, the, in 2008, we're still dealing with an economic collapse that we haven't recovered from. And what someone who works in investment told me, oh, this war is excellent for oil. The oil prices are going up. And as you say, right, we, we need to realize that the source the root of all these issues is not, you know, the politics of one country or another, but rather the system that drives it, right? And the system that is being, the, the fuels, very few people, very few powerful people, <laughs> and the rest of us just fight amongst each other for the crumbs. So as we see other parts of the world, you know, constantly in resistance of capitalism. We see it in Cuba, you know, after 60 years of blockades and sanctions, the people of Cuba are still standing, you know, they're still thriving in ways 
that are unimaginable because they have, you know, they've been blocked. And yet they have one of the most advanced medical systems in the midst of pandemic. They have done amazing compared to some industrialists in Western countries, even Canada or the UK, you know, or the US for that matter. So clearly we are resilient people. We are, you know, able to fight back to create systems despite the aggression we're faced. Uh, Venezuela is another example, you know, with all the sanctions, they're still being able to fight back all the incursions and the invasions the states has thrown at them. What does this chapter mean for them? Like this this war with Russia clearly um, will block some support that they may have received from Russia. How do you feel this might impact uh, some of the social movements in Latin America? Yes, I, I think we should uh, we should look at this from two, at least two different points of view. One is what you were saying at the beginning about the economic crisis. And in my opinion, uh, the, this uh, war and the sanctions of the West against Russia will worsen the economic situation in general. Higher oil prices and higher gas prices will hit the economies of ordinary people who have to hit their homes and they have to uh, switch, switch on the lights. And uh, at a time when energy prices were already going up very, very quickly, this will add to inf- inflationary pressures that already existed in the world economy. And uh, it will disrupt world trade to a certain extent. And this can trigger another economic recession when we, as you say, we haven't still fully recovered from the one in 2008, never mind the one during the during the pandemic. So this is the future of capitalism, future of, of uh, at best, sluggish economic growth and, and constant uh, relapses into into recession and working people are going to be asked to pay for this this is this is the worst part of this i mean during the pandemic the government spent a lot of money bailing out the companies bailing out the big business but uh, now when it when the recession comes we, we will have to pay they will not make any sacrifices this is how the system works then there's the other side of what's the impact of this for for countries in latin america and first of all there's the, the immediate practical consequences higher prices of oil are good for venezuela um, but the problem is that venezuela is under sanctions from the u.s so it's, it's difficult to sell this oil it still has some uh, customers China, Iran, and uh, other countries, but uh, obviously it makes the whole situation much more difficult. But yes, in, in a certain sense, partially, let's say, Venezuela will benefit from higher oil prices at the time when it's starting to recover its production slightly. Then in the case of Cuba, I will say that Cuba was relying to a certain extent on uh, Russian t- tourism coming into the island, and this is now being cut off. Uh, Russian planes, they've been blocked from the airspace of many other countries. It's been stopped, the, the, the flux of, uh, of tourists to, to Cuba. On a more general point of view, yes, this, these two countries, Venezuela and Cuba, surrounded and blockaded by U.S. Uh, imperialism, had made some deals with other countries, Russia and China amongst them. And if China uh, and if Russia's economy is severely hit by this recession, then by this sorry by these sanctions and military aggression, economic aggression, then uh, they will they will be in a, in a, in less of a position to to help Venezuela and and Cuba. Uh, at the end of the day, what I will say is that in the medium and long term, the only solution is the revolution must spread to other countries. You can't really have revolution just in one country and, and having to depend on allies which are not trustworthy allies because in reality the, the Russia is a capitalist country Russia doesn't share the same uh, the same project of the Bolivarian revolution or the Cuban revolution where in Cuba capitalism has been abolished uh, however Russia might be interested for geostrategic reasons in, in helping these two these two countries that's a different matter but the only reliable allies that the Venezuelan uh, working people and the Cuban revolution can have is, is the workers of other countries that are also going through certain experiences. They are learning, they are developing the tools and, of struggle. And uh, in my opinion, they should uh, emulate the Cuban revolution by taking an, an anti-capitalist uh, road. In, in the medium term, this is the only solution. In the short term, we'll have to struggle with what we, what we have, what's, uh, what's available to us. 
but the general strategy should be one of, uh, of revolution, workers and peasants and the poor rising up and taking power and removing the capitalists from, from power in one country after another. This is the only way to end with, with a system that causes war, suffering, hunger, and, and so on for, for hundreds of millions of people all the time. Um, what excites you? What are some of the exciting uh, revolutionary processes you see that are not being covered in the media right now because they're trying to focus us on this idea of impending doom between Russia and NATO. And in, in the process, we, we lose sight of our own responsibility, our own power to create revolutionary movements within our countries, within our communities. Yes, I will. I will say that one interesting thing that's uh, happened as we come to to the end of the of the pandemic, hopefully, is that there has been a certain recovery of the workers' uh, movement in a number of uh, advanced capitalist uh, countries. In in what sense? Uh, this is not yet a massive wave of strikes or anything like this, but uh, but but there has been uh, an uptick of, of industrial activity because as inflation goes up, the workers are forced to fight back and and try to recover their purchasing power. So we've seen big strikes, for instance, in Spain of the metal workers in Cadiz. They went on, on an all-out strike sometime at the end of last year. And here in Britain, we've seen a spate of strikes, strikes of, for instance, of cleaners and security guards in the in hospitals and universities that they want their contracts taken back in-house instead of being outsourced. And some of them have won. Yesterday, one, one group of workers, but 300 outsourced uh, cleaners uh, at the Barts Hospital, they won uh, the contract being taken back in-house or refuse collectors, they managed to get big pay increases uh, as a result of the lack of, of uh, skilled lorry drivers uh, and in, in order to recover the purchasing uh, power of the wages. Uh, there's been lots of movements like this, some big, some small, but that uh, I will say indicate the beginning of the recovery of the workers' movement. Uh, right now, there is a massive uh, national dispute of university lecturers in, in Britain and, and also in the United States. So last uh, November, there was an, an uptick of industrial activity, big groups of workers declaring strikes or, or voting for strike. Some of them going uh, on strike against the wish of the <laughs> trade union leaders, which is also very interesting. So that's one thing. The other thing I will say is that uh, the pandemic has also brought a general questioning of the of the capitalist uh, system as a system that is unable uh, to deal with a, with, a, with a health emergency this way because it always puts profits before people's lives. And now I will say with this situation of war, this contradiction becomes even more apparent. You know, there is no, they, they tell us there's no money for education, for health care, for pensions, but they very quickly find money for war, for sending weapons to Ukraine, for rearming NATO and all of this. It's always the same when, when it's in the interest of the ruling class. They find money. They find money where? By, by squeezing the workers even more. And this, I will say, will add to this, to this general mood of questioning of the capitalist system. To, to this, we have to add, obviously, the, the, the climate emergency, which is also not being dealt with, also because of capitalist uh, interests. So I would say we, we live in very interesting times. Thank you for listening to Latin Waves. Latin Waves is an independently produced syndicated radio program made available for free to campus and community radios and also to the world at latinwaysmedia.com. Please visit the website to hear previous shows, hear about upcoming events, and consider becoming a member for as little as $1 per month.